Christ in whom we share a great inheritance, which we are assured of by the seal which he has sealed us with to those who trust in him for life, which is the Holy Spirit. Um, announcements. I'm taking a place for Corny today. Their uh, half the ministerial team has gone biking for some reason. That's fun, I guess. <laughs> but they're in uh, Sault Ste. Marie on their way back, so yeah, I'm here for Corny's um, time. So nothing new really in the announcements except uh, just um, the dates to save coming up. August 7th at 9 a.m., there's the deacon election for uh, those who are nominated. So if you are available and you have time, please come on out to um, vote. And uh, let's not forget to pray for the brothers and their families as um, it's a new journey for them, for sure. And September 9th for the pastor ordinations for myself and Corny. Um, I just have written beside here in my notes, pray with four exclamation points. So I'll let you decipher what that means. Um, and a couple prayer requests. Uh, John and Sarah Weeb. John had a hernia surgery last week, and uh, it went well. So they're just looking for um, prayer for a speedy recovery. And yeah, and let's continue to pray for the Hebert family. I know there's some new circumstances that have arised in that situation. So let's continue to pray for them for healing and for whatever obstacles they may face coming in these next coming weeks and months and in years. I'm sure it's, they're not gonna be the same from this situation. And uh, also with Mary Epp as well, if you, um, if you guys know them at all, I uh, would just encourage you to reach out, send a text, bring a meal, just let them know that you're thinking of them and praying for them as, yeah, it's gotta be difficult to lose a loved one, especially with a full house. So other than that, there's no other new announcements. My scripture reading is Revelations 21, uh, 1 through 6. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also, there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of the heaven from God prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the heavens saying, behold, the tabernacle of God is with men and he will dwell with them and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain for the former things have passed away. Then I, then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of water of life freely to him who thirsts. So with that, bow with me for prayer. God, we just come before you today and... Uh, we thank you, we have breath in our lungs, we have mobility in our limbs, and we're able to gather as a family once again on a Sunday morning to worship you, and uh, we have you in common. And uh, that, is, that is all we need. Uh, we may not have the same interests and same hobbies as, as one another, but we have you. And from that, we can, we can build community, we can relate with one another, we can relate through our past circumstances, we can um, encourage one another as we we need encouragement as we are not created to be alone. We're created to be relational and you know this and that is why you have placed us amongst people who love us, people who care for us, people who want to see the best for us. And I thank you for, for all those that, um, that have done so for me, have encouraged me, have prayed for me, have been a shoulder to cry on, have been just a, a pillar in times of need. And I pray that each one here would be able to find somebody like that in, in, this, in this body. And may we grow, may we know you more. Um, as Jimmy said in the, in the office, that we, not even at the end of our life, we, we can know everything. We can, but we can know you in the midst. We can know you in the hard times. We can know you in the good times. We thank you that you've made that available to us freely. And uh, I just... 
I want to pray for the Ebert family as they are going through a circumstance that nobody can plan for. It's, it's a freak accident, and they are, they, will be, they, are, they are affected, and they will be affected for the whole life. It's not something that just goes away. I pray that they would rely on you for their strength, that they would have these people that I spoke about earlier in their lives, these pillars, these people that will encourage them and strengthen them in, in this tough moment. Be with them, I pray for healing for, the, for, the, um, for Tina and for the two children. They, they believe they had surgery uh, a week ago and the surgeries went well for the children and I believe Tina's, they're releasing some of the, uh, um, the sedative that they have her underneath slowly and slowly. So I pray that you would continue to be with them and uh, in, the, in the surrounding families as well. I'd also like to lift up Mary up in her, uh, in her, four, in her four daughters. Uh, it's, uh, it's been about a week, a little more than a week since Jake's passing, and I can only imagine if, as each day goes on and on, and you get further and further away from the, from the date of the passing, and it seems like everybody around you may, may be moving on and may have, uh, it's just another day for them, but Mary, she's left with the, um, with the responsibilities and with the outcome of this tragedy. I pray that she would rely on you. It's so easy to uh, fall into a to fall into a pit. I pray that she would also have these people around her that would pray for her, that would encourage her, that would send meals to her, that she wouldn't have to worry about uh, providing a meal for her family, that she can freely mourn her husband. And I thank you for family. I thank you for what you have built here and what you are going to do. Um, you are good. So thank you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, everyone. It's good to see you. I want to greet you uh, with the way that Paul actually closes Ephesians chapter 6. And he says, Peace be to you, brothers and sisters, and love with faith. From God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace be with all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with love incorruptible. I want to welcome you if you are new to, uh, to SMC. Um, and again, welcome you, all you familiar faces and family who are here all the time. Uh, it is still good to see you on a weekly basis. Um, as most of you are aware, my journey through Mark, I think, has only, um, I think only just begun. Um, and from the last couple of services, I've been transferred over to Matthew because Matthew offers a perspective to uh, Jesus walking on water that Mark doesn't cover. But I'm kind of stuck here for a little bit because there's so much more to expose, and uh, to be honest, today is, is going to be a tough one. Um, and so I am going to ask you to, to pay attention as much as you can um, because I think so much of what I'm going to say has fits in well with what Pastor Mike has already been saying, what Pastor Jake has already been saying. And so, yes, we're going to be looking at the rebuke of Jesus when he rebukes us, when he chastises us, when he disciplines us, and he says things that hurt our soul, and how that fits in with everything else that we've been hearing. And I, I find that the, the timing is interesting because it isn't like Mike was choosing to pick the service that he had so they would fit with what I was going to be speaking about. It, it is all just falling in line. So I hope that you see the connection. I hope that you see the love that God has for you today. Pastor Mike's been exposing uh, the Psalms chapter, six, uh, chapter 16. And the last time he was up before the communion service, he was exposing just verse 3. And verse 3 says, As for the saints in the land, they are the excellent ones in whom is all my delight. And now that's God talking about all of you who believe in Jesus. All of you who believe in Christ are the excellent ones, and God's delight is in you. Think about that. What do you delight in? What makes you happy? What fills you with joy? That feeling is what God has for you, for those of you who believe in Christ. His delight is in you. And there are many other scriptures that talk about the delight of God. Because if we are his children and he is our father, he delights in us simply because we're his children. Before we even do anything, he just, he simply delights in us. Last, uh, I believe it was last week, Pastor Jake, 
He talked about not being who we once were, that we are now somebody different. Before we were changed by Christ, we were this long list of evil. We were unrighteous, and we would not inherit the kingdom of God because of our unrighteousness. This is who we used to be. But for those of us who believe in Christ, we have been washed, we have been made clean, we are given a clean slate. And I think every once in a while we, we, we wish that for ourselves. I wish I could just start over again. You can. He has washed you already. You are a clean slate. And Jake was exposing again that we've been washed, we've been sanctified, we've been set apart, we've been justified, we've actually been made righteous in the name of Christ by the Spirit of God, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 to 11. And I, I, I would encourage you guys to get into the habit of taking notes. I've been doing that ever since we started the video series, and it's helped me immensely to stay concentrated, to see the train of thought, to see what the scriptures are actually saying. And so I would encourage you guys to take notes um, because I think it helps us immensely understanding the word of God. And as I've been doing that, listening to these sermons back to back, like Pastor Mike's and Pastor Jake's, I see that there's a connection between the two. And I find that where I find myself today fits right in there. And, and I hope that you guys get to see that today. By looking at the rebuke of Christ, my flesh wants to take over and be afraid that you're going to misunderstand where I'm going today. I'm afraid that you're going to hear a contradiction to what Pastor Mike said when he exposed to us that God delights in his children. Because we're looking at the rebuke of Jesus today when he disciplines us. But I want to assure you that what I have discovered is not a contradiction. It is the reality of the person of Christ. And we get to see a well-rounded picture of who he is and why it is that he rebukes us. Why it is that we are disciplined by him. And the importance of understanding that he is a God of love and a God of justice at the same time. You can't have one without the other. And so we get to see this pure righteousness of God. You see, what I want you to be very clear about, or what I want to be very clear about is, is that for those of you who are in Christ, God stands for you and with you. His delight in you will never cease. It will always be there. But he stands against our deeds in the flesh, and he cannot delight in those. That does not change his delight in who we are in Christ. Because we are not our flesh. We are not the deeds of our flesh. We are spiritually reconnected with God, and that is where his delight is, because that part can never change. So I hope that that truth is maintained through my exposing of the scripture this morning, that you will Hear that as I go through and leave with that understanding that God delights in you because you are his child, but he does not delight in our actions of the flesh. And I hopefully can explain that to you this morning. So, we are in Matthew chapter 14, verse 31 today. And this is, again, it's just one verse in the story where Jesus walks on water, and then Peter says, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And Jesus says to Peter, come, and Peter walks on water amazing, but has nothing to do with the water, everything to do with faith that Peter has in Christ. And of course, as we all know, Peter looks away for just a moment and begins to sink, and he cries out, Lord, save me. Verse 31, Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying to him, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? I want you to get this picture Peter is sinking in the water, and I'm pretty sure he can swim. He is a fisherman by trade. But instead, he says, Lord, save me. And this word here where it says that Jesus reached out his hand and took a hold of him, it is an aggressive move. Jesus is not just like, you know, pulling him out of the water. He is grabbing him and saving his life. That's what this word is, to take hold of him. And he's holding him. And while he's holding him, he says this hurtful statement. Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? 
I find it interesting that Peter is the only non-divine being that we have recorded in history to do what only God can do, walk on water, which he did by faith. That was the only way. What I wonder is, why didn't Jesus praise Peter right there and then? Pull him out of the water and say, good job. You made it halfway to me, or very close at least. Why didn't he praise him? Instead of being commended for his faith, Peter is rebuked by his teacher for having doubted. And I think that's difficult to understand. And this isn't the only time. And we may think this is out of character of Jesus. This is the part of Jesus that we don't like because he says words that hurt us deeply. But this isn't the only time. If you read Matthew chapter 6, verses 28 to 30, and chapter 8, verses 25 to 26, and chapter 16, verses 8 to 11, and chapter 17, verses 17 to 18, you'll see Jesus using this term over and over again, you of little faith. Cut me deep every time. You of little faith. In Mark chapter 16, Jesus rebukes his disciples for their unbelief and hardened hearts, for not believing the news that he was raised from the dead. People were telling them, he is risen. They wouldn't believe him. And when Jesus meets up with them, he rebukes them to their face for their hardened hearts and unbelief because they didn't believe the good news. They didn't believe by faith. In Mark chapter 6, we read about Jesus being rejected by the people of his own town, and he marvels at their unbelief, at their lack of faith. And the only record we have of Jesus marveling at anything is in regards to faith. And the other record is that he was marveled at the faith of a centurion who had faith enough to believe that Jesus could heal his servant from a distance. Jesus is stressing the importance of exercising faith in every aspect of life, whether it's about food or clothing, storms or doctrine, the demonic realm, and most importantly, the good news. He's about this thing called faith. If you read through those chapters that I mentioned, and if you want to talk to me afterwards, I can give you all my notes. I have no problem doing that. If you read through those chapters, you will find Jesus saying things that give us a feeling that he is irritated, he is disappointed, and very annoyed at the people that he's with. We don't want to see this part of Jesus. We want the loving, gracious, forgiving, loving Jesus. Who is this guy? It's the same person. Jesus says things like, how is it that you still don't understand? How long must I be with you and bear with you, you faithless and twisted generation? He's talking to his disciples. Why are you afraid, O oh, you faithless, O oh, you of little faith? He's talking to his disciples. Why does he talk to them like this? And what does Jesus mean when he says little faith? Little faith is defined as little in number or few in occurrence. It doesn't happen very often. Little faith des describes someone who is dull in hearing the Lord's voice and not being fully interested in walking intimately with him. But the way that Paul puts it, we get a much more severe understanding why Jesus is so hard on us on this topic of faith. And so I want to now go through just some, some scriptures to point out the importance of faith. Romans 14, 23 says that whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. Now there's a, there's a way to start. And that's very straightforward. Whatever is not done from faith is sin. Period. Now, the life of a believer is a life of faith. That is the core of who we are, a life of faith, right? The life that I live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and died for me, Galatians 2.20. The life of a, of a believer is a life dependent on the Father completely. That is the life of a believer. When we act independently of Father, we sin because we walk in dead flesh and not in the spirit of faith. This was at the heart of Jake's message last week. We are called 
to put off the old person we used to be. And we do that by faith. That person was crucified with Christ. So why should we live like a corpse any longer? Why do we want to live like a dead person? We are called by faith to put on Christ and truly live. When we in faith obey the call of Christ and truly hear his voice and we fully respond, it is then that God is pleased with us. Why? Because in faith we believe his word and trust him and he is pleased with us. On the other hand, without faith, without faith, it is impossible to please God. That is word for word, Hebrews 11, verse 6. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Romans 8, 8 says the same thing, that those who are in the flesh cannot please God. It's impossible. Can't do it. So, how do we reconcile the pleasure of God and his saints with the rebuke of Jesus who appears to be disappointed when we act according to the flesh? How do those two fit together? Now, looking at the relationship between Jesus and Peter, there is no, de- no doubt that Jesus loved Peter immensely. He loved him dearly. But it is also very clear that Peter was probably rebuked more than the rest of them. He got it from Jesus all the time. Oh, you have little faith. Why did you doubt? Satan, get behind me. Like, what are, what are you talking about? The look that Jesus gives Peter after Peter denies him three times. The heartbreak. Peter is hurt all the time. When Jesus asks Peter three times, do you love me? And after the third time, it says that Peter was hurt. Why does Jesus keep offending Peter? What is Jesus trying to get at? It's clear that Jesus loves Peter, but why does he rebuke him so? What are we to learn from Christ's rebuke and his discipline? Before we do that, we have to first establish the importance of faith. And here we're going to those scriptures that Paul writes. And it needs to be, it needs to be clear to us. So in Romans chapter 3, verses 21 to 28, keep your eyes out on this word, or your ears, I guess, uh, on this word faith. So Paul writes, But now the righteousness of God has been made manifested apart from the law. Right? So now all the good things that you do is not going to gain you righteousness. It's now apart from the law. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all, it is by faith. Nothing that we can do better than somebody else, it is by faith. By simply believing, that is where we get our righteousness from, from God, is by faith. He carries on to say, for there's no distinction, and Jake covered this verse specifically last week. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption of of Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by doing a good job. No. By faith. We receive all of this by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over the former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and be the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. If you have faith in Christ, he is your justifier. He's the one that makes you right with God. He is the one who makes you so that you can stand before God and say, I have no fault because Jesus took care of it all for me, and I believe that by faith. And then Paul asks the question, so then what becomes of our boasting? What can I brag about? Nothing. He says, it is excluded. And then he asks another question, then by what law is it excluded? By the law of works? No, again, you can't work for this stuff. He says, your boasting or your right to brag is excluded by the law of faith. When we have faith in Christ, there's, we have no right to brag, no right to boast because Jesus did all the work and we simply believe him. This is the importance of faith. 
For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. You can never be good enough for the righteousness of Christ in the works of the law. It has to be done by faith. It's the only way. Romans 5, 1 to 2 says, Therefore, since we have been justified by, again, not your good works, by faith, we have peace with God. That should stun us. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And this is the peace that the angels declared at the coming of Jesus' birth in Luke chapter 2, when they say, peace on earth among those with whom God is pleased. When we have peace with God, God is pleased because we have peace with him. We now have communion and relationship with him. Paul carries on to say, through him we have also obtained access by faith in which we stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. I think about that verse, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 1 to 13 says that in Christ Jesus our Lord, we have the boldness and access to the Father with confidence through our faith in him. And none of us can get to the Father except by faith in his Son. Do you see the importance of faith? And in verse 17 of Ephesians 3, we read that Christ dwells in our hearts. How? Somebody tell me. By faith. If you wonder if you're saved or not, and you doubt your salvation, Scripture says that if you believe, you will be saved. And if you are saved, then where does Christ dwell? In your hearts. How do you know that? By faith. It seems so illogical for us to just by faith believe that that's true, but that, that's the case. There's nothing we can do about that. The only thing we have is faith, and that's why it's so important. He dwells in our hearts through faith. It is also by this faith we have strength to understand the limitless nature of Christ's love. It talks about the, the width, the depth, the breadth of his life, and that we can't be separated from that. It is by faith we begin to understand what that is. And that this love surpasses knowledge so that we may be filled with all the fullness of God. And finally, I want to share this last piece of scripture regarding the importance of faith from Peter himself. The guy who got pulled out of the water and was rebuked for failing to walk the whole way. Peter says, In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved in various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith... And he says, your faith is more precious than gold. Why? Because gold perishes. Though it is tested by fire. And he says, may it be found to result in the praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And guess what happened? When Peter and Jesus walked back to the boat, the disciples fell on their faces and they worshiped Jesus. That's the result. And that's what Peter is saying here the praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus, re being revealed as to who he is. Even after he was rebuked, he worshiped him. And he continues to say, though you have not seen him, that is us, we have not seen him. Though we have not seen him, we love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice <clears throat> with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, which is what? Salvation of your souls. Again, faith. It all comes by faith. This is why Jesus is so severe with us on the topic of faith. Because without faith, we have nothing. Without faith in Christ's atonement, we remain condemned in our sin. Without faith, the wrath of God is still upon us, and we do not have peace with him. Without faith, we do not know the forgiveness of God or his grace. Without faith, we are unable to enter into his presence to make our requests known, and thereby do not have our prayers answered. 
Without faith, our spirit remains dead and we are left to find our identity in everything this world throws our way. Without faith, we are tossed back and forth and we do not know who we are. Without faith, we will never be satisfied. Without faith, we choose death. That's the natural. That's the natural process. Every time that we walk according to the flesh, we exercise faithlessness in God's ability to meet our needs. And every time we choose our own way, we replay the moment in Eden when Adam and Eve took the fruit of the wrong tree and separated themselves from God. How do you think God feels about that? Jesus is very stern in the matter of faith, for without it we lose everything and receive nothing from what God has already freely given. God has spent the most precious thing that he has. And all he's asking us to do is to have faith and believe in that person in everything that we do. He's asking you to stop trying to be somebody that you're not. He's asking you to stop trying to achieve righteousness apart from faith in Christ. He's asking you to enter into a relationship with him and trust in him and walk with him. Jesus is very stern in the matter of faith. But with faith, everything changes. And the unimaginable work of God that he has already done becomes a reality in the lives of the people who are broken and need grace and forgiveness. The work that he has already done then becomes a reality. It becomes full. When Peter walked on water, he exercised his teeny tiny faith in God like a child letting go of the coffee table for the first time to take a couple of steps towards daddy or mommy. But then in one tiny distraction, Peter wavered like a child again, grabbing a hold of that coffee table. It's like, oh, there's my security again. And the parent is like, oh, you were so close. Why did you hold on again? I wanted you to take every step without the coffee table towards me. I believed you could do it, but you doubted, and you grabbed that coffee table again. There is a sense of disappointment, but not in the child, but the fact that he grabbed on again. That's the, 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 the distinction that I want to make today. The, the pleasure that the father has in the child or the mother has in the child never goes away. Why? Because that's my child. That's just the way that it is. But it's like, oh, you grabbed on to the table again. But he's like, let's try it again. And again, and again, and again. And as many times as we grab onto that table, it's like, you grab the table again. Let's try it again. I love the definition of love in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. The first word that describes love is patience. You think about God's unending patience and that love is defined by that. He doesn't grow tired of rebuking us and then encouraging us to do it again. Walk without the coffee table. Just walk on your own two feet because I know you can. I know you doubt yourself, but I know you can do it. Have faith in me. Faith is at the core of being a child of God trapped in a body of sin. God is always pleased with those who are his children because his children are identified with his son who gave up everything so that we could live. And by faith, we believe that God is pleased those who believe in the name of Jesus for salvation are saved. They are perfect. They are completely sanctified, justified, and they are holy. That is the condition of our spirit in Christ, which is not of anything we've done, but by the work of God himself. And we simply believe and inherit that by faith. And here's the thing. God is always pleased with his work because his work doesn't disappoint. And so when he sees his work in you, he is always pleased 
at the work that he does in you. In him, we lack nothing. We have the peace of God, and he is totally satisfied. Because if you believe in Jesus and he sees you, he sees his son. And we know that God is pleased with his son. Before we came to Christ, we had no choice but to live in sin. It doesn't matter how good of a person you are. Apart from Christ, you have no choice but to live in sin. That is your only option. That's why you're a slave to sin without Christ. Because there's no other way out. But now that we've come to Christ, and he lives in us through his Holy Spirit, we have a choice. We now get to choose him or our flesh. We can now choose to live in the flesh like we used to live, or we can choose to live by the new way of the Spirit of God that he has already provided. You see, when we choose the flesh, we choose death. And when we choose death, we choose separation from the very God who lives within us. In that moment, we are a walking contradiction. Now again, we are identified with Jesus. But we're walking like a contradiction. Thinking about that, we choose separation from the very God who lives within us. There is a conflict. There is a battle. You see, he lives in this body of sin in real time. Even though he has no beginning and no end, he lives in this body, in your bodies, in real time. He doesn't leave. If you believe in him, you are sealed for the day of redemption. He doesn't leave. Even when you sin, he doesn't leave. He feels what you feel. He knows what you think and he sees what you see. He knows what you struggle with and why you keep grabbing that coffee table. But he continually and with unending patience calls us to himself. He calls us to live by his spirit, to trust in him. For all who believe, like I said, we are sealed for the day of redemption. In the meantime, we are going to struggle with sin and God remains in us. And because he remains in us, his delight is always in us because he is in us. And 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 13 says that when we are faithless, and think about this. Jesus talks about this idea of divorce and the grounds that is appropriate for that is faithlessness. And if you think about God's relationship with Israel in the Old Testament, he uses marriage a lot to describe the faithlessness of his people and his continued faithfulness to his people. And in 2 Timothy, we see that when we are faithless, he remains faithful. See, he's unchanging. He doesn't change his mind about that. When we choose the flesh, we put aside faith. And we've already seen that without faith, it's impossible to please God. So do you see the connection that when we choose the flesh, we put aside faith. When we remove faith, we cannot please God by our actions. When we choose the flesh, we actually war against the Holy Spirit. We wage war. This is not a friendly exchange. And neither does God condone our fleshly behavior, which is why he's not pleased in the actions that we do that promote death. Because God is not about death, except in the death of his son to bring us back to what? Life. The end goal is life and transformation. So how can God be pleased and disappointed with you at the same time? The most practical example I've already given you. That child who is loved by his parent. And he just hangs onto that table and refuses to let go. Where's the faith, right? It's just, it's, it seems so simple. The other example that I love is the prodigal son story. We love that story. 
we have to come to the conclusion that the father was disappointed in the younger son who says, I want all of my inheritance, and then leaves him and squanders everything in the city. And he comes back to his father with nothing, but the whole time that he's been gone, the father is waiting for his son to return. Disappointed that he took everything and left, but the love never went away because he's my child and I want him to come back. And the moment that he comes back with nothing, the father disregards his attempt to explain why he has nothing and just says, bring the robe, bring the ring, put sandals on his feet, go kill the fattened calf, we're gonna have a party because my child has returned by faith. The father's delight was always in the child himself. Because of who he was and not because of what he did. The father's disappointment was in what the son did and not who the son was. I hope you see the difference there. We too quickly liken God's disappointment to the older son in that story. Because when that younger son comes back, the older son disowns his own brother. He says to the father, your son has returned and you've done all this for him. See, we think that that's how God responds and that God now wants nothing to do with us because of how we behaved. That is not the case. We are all the prodigal son. And the father delights in our return in faith. If we think we have to please God by our actions, then we will believe that he is disappointed in who we are because we fail to behave well. Tell me, what work did you do to be saved? Exactly nothing. You did nothing to be saved. Jesus did all the work. And we come to the cross and we believe. And then everything that he accomplished gets put onto us. We receive salvation by faith alone. It is a gift of God by grace. From the very beginning, there's nothing that we did or could do to earn God's favor. Salvation was given to us because we believed. And then we were immediately just like Jesus immediately grabs Peter's hand, we are immediately adopted as legit children of God. We now belong to his family. And guess what? God delights in his children. Before we have done anything, God's delight was in us the moment we believed. Why? Because we had faith that the work on the cross was enough. Yeah, I'm a dirty, rotten sinner. But what Jesus did is enough. I'm no longer that person by faith. He is now our life. Peter was made to walk on the water because of faith. And because of faith, Peter had the option to walk all the way to Jesus and all the way back without ever failing. He had the option, but he looked away. And the moment he looked away, he chose separation and he sank. But he had the option, and that's the power of God, by faith. The last time that I was up here, I had, I had said that we are all designed, every day, we are designed to walk above the circumstances of our everyday life, by faith. In Christ, that is our new design. And that is because the God who can walk on water lives inside of us by faith. God is disappointed when we choose the flesh because we fail to allow him to live through us. We keep saying, God in us and through us. Christ in us and through us. I think we have a difficulty with the through us part. Because God in us, his delight is always there, regardless of what we do. And when we fail to allow God to work through us, there's disappointment in our lack of faith in that he is able to work through us. 
His pleasure is always there because he is in us, but he wants to work through us. Change us and change everyone else around us. His delight remains. But when we fail to allow him to live through us, he chastises us and he disciplines us. And he does this out of love. If you look at Hebrews chapter 12, verse 6, it says, The Lord disciplines the one he loves, and he chastises every son whom he receives. And ladies, if you read the word son in the New Testament, very often it just means child. He's not picking favorites on men, okay? The Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. Oh, you of little faith is Christ's rebuke to Peter, choosing the flesh in the middle of experiencing victory in the spirit. Why would you choose the flesh? You are walking on the waters. You are rising above the circumstances. You are living in victory. And then why did you choose the flesh? Do you see the result of choosing the flesh? We sink. That is disappointing. But because God delights in us, he immediately stretches out when we call for help and he pulls us out and he holds us. I believe it hurts God when we behave like dead people. The dead people that we used to be. And your homework would be to read Ephesians chapter 4, verses 25 to 32. We are not that dead person anymore. Is Christ alive? Yeah. Where does he live if you believe in him? He, believes, he lives in you. And if he's alive in you, are you alive? Yeah. Forever. If you're alive forever. You are no longer the dead person you used to be. If you are struggling with your faith, and I should be putting a mirror up here so I can just stare at myself when I say this. If you're struggling in your faith and struggling with sin, then join the rest of us. The devil likes to put this thing in our ear to say you're the only one. That no one struggles and suffers like you do. You're alone in this. No one can help you. That's a lie. See, faith is recklessly abandoning our reason in the flesh to simply believe in God like a child. And when we get all grown up, we don't, want to, we don't want to be humbled down to the innocence of a child. John, John writes that God's children do not make a practice of sinning. And then Paul further expands on this to say that when we do sin, listen to this, that when we do sin, it is not actually us who sins, but the sin that's in our body that does it. So there again is that separation See, in Christ, you are not your flesh. In Christ, you're not the way that you look. In Christ, you're not the way that you think, the way that you feel, or the things you choose to do. In Christ, you are at the very, very core, the center. You are spiritually alive, and that is where your identity is. And because God lives there, that part does not change, even though your emotions do this. And because of that, your actions do this and this and this. God remains steady, steadfast, and unchangeable at the center of who you are because you believe. And because that is true, his pleasure is always in that because that is who you truly are. In Christ, you are not your flesh. And if you do not have faith, consider where it comes from. Romans 10, 14 to 17 it says, how then will they call on him whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they've never heard? And how are they to hear without somebody preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. Furthermore, but they have not all obeyed the gospel. See, the gospel call is something to, be obe something to be obeyed. It is a command. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed 
what he has heard from us. So the conclusion that is, so faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. That's where faith comes from. And faith produces an obedience to the call of the gospel, which the only proper response is to say, yes, I believe. That is the only proper response. I'm going to quote Pastor Mike from the last time he was up here in not the communion service, the one before. He says, the craziest thing about being a Christian is this thing called faith. It's crazy. But it is a faith that is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction or the evidence of things not seen. Hebrews 11, chapter one, or verse 1. See, in Christ, we have eternal life, which we get to experience now in this time, in our bodies. But yet, we do not know the fullness of it. By faith, we are assured of this life that we hope for. It is not a gamble or a possibility, but it is an assurance it is faith. Faith is the evidence of the forgiveness we have in Christ, the grace that has been given to us as a free gift, the love of God who loved me while I was his enemy. That is faith. It is invisible but not blind. We have assurance and evidence in the work that we know God is doing in our inner being. It is there. We know that it is there. So I want to close with saying that this term you of little faith. It's God's expression of disappointment when we choose death instead of life. In this expression, his desire for you is that you live by faith in him so that you can experience what it is already true about you as a Christian. So that God can be manifested in our lives in everything that we do. Have you guys ever asked the question or told yourself, I don't feel like a Christian? I just don't feel like I belong to God anymore. And why is that? If you just rewind a little bit, you're going to look at all the actions that you've been committing in the recent past. And you're going to come to the conclusion it's because I did this, 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 and this, and oh my, the list goes on. All of these things have now separated me from God and I'm no longer his child. That's not true. Do you see the difference that if you believe in him for salvation, you will be his child forever. But when we act independently of him, we sever ourselves from the presence of God in the way that we feel, in the way that we think, in the choices that we make. And then we are then trapped into believing a lie that says that you are no longer a child of God. We need faith to always be that thing that says, I believe in God regardless of what I have done because what he has said and shown is true, whether I exist or not. And so by faith, we believe. See, faith isn't based on emotion or feeling. It doesn't come from there. Faith is actually based on what's true, what has come to pass. We put our faith in what already exists, God's love for you already exists. His forgiveness for you already exists. His grace is limitless and boundless already for you. It already exists. We put our faith in something that already stands to be true. Ephesians 2 verses 1 to 10 says that we were dead in our sins in which we used to live. But because of God's great mercy, he made us alive in Christ. And so he has actually recreated us in him to do good works. So works is a part of it, but works isn't the beginning. It's not where we start. We start with faith. Works are the, is the product of faith. So, this rebuke of Jesus, these harsh words that he has that cut so deep, his words are an invitation for us to choose life. So choose life. To choose life instead of death. Choose to live out who you truly are in Christ and not who you used to be in the flesh. 
even though he is hurt and disappointed by our actions when we choose to walk in the flesh, God's delight is in us because he has raised us from the dead. And he lives inside of us. So let's live like we've been raised from the dead. Let's live like we're alive. Let's put our faith in him. Let's pray. Father, I just, I just pray for understanding and clarity. I think the deeper we get into your word if, and the more we try to understand it with our own wisdom and our own knowledge, it just becomes more convoluted. So I pray that in times like this that we come to you in complete faith and innocence of a child and adopt that mentality where we just simply come before you and, and listen to your word and just take it in because we know that you are true. If you weren't true, then nothing would exist. Because everything does exist, there has to be some standard of consistency, unchangeability, a, a truth and a love that is unfailing. And because we exist, we have to understand that that is you. And by faith, we believe that. And if we can start there, Father, that in faith we believe that you exist as the writer of Hebrews puts it, then we can begin to please you because we just believe by faith. And not of anything that we do or don't do. I pray for all the hearts and the minds in this room, for all the souls that are sitting in these pews and listening online. I pray that we all come to you and we ask you for wisdom and understanding that we would ask you for strength to find our delight in you as your delight is in us so that our actions are not driven by a need to try and make you happy, but Father, that because we are already happy in you, that we are already delighted in you, that that is the fuel for the good works that we want to do because you've already put them there for us, that we simply want to be in your presence forever and always and never leave that place and always experience the victory that you have for us. I pray that we are all humbled to the point of coming to you with nothing but our faith, to believe in everything that you have already done, all the grace that you've already given, the clean slate that you have made us, and that we can declare righteousness because of your work on the cross. I pray that as we go through this week, that with all the opportunities that we are given in every day to choose life or to choose death, Father, I pray that you give us the strength to choose life that we would choose you. We would choose to walk above the waters all the way to you without holding onto the coffee table. Father, we thank you for your love for us and that your delight in us is undying. I thank you that we are identified with you there. I pray that you continue to transform us into the image of your son in whom we thank you for his journey to the cross, which he did by faith. And that we are now saved and sealed for the day of redemption because of your work. Father, increase our faith. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you want to take a moment, either sitting where you are or on your knees, we'll just take a quiet moment in prayer. Father, thank you for being with us and hearing our prayers. In Jesus' name, amen. And as the worship team comes up, I'll leave you with a benediction from Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20, which says, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we can ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. May go in the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ.